It's since the late 1970s that game sounds and music had already found an audience outside the games. They could be heard in TV shows, commercials, films, and other musical genres. In Japan, the first original soundtrack album of Namco titles was released already in 1984, and the first dedicated label for chip music, called GMO Records, as an imprint of Alpha Records, was founded in 1986. You can see this Namco um, cover uh, in the middle row on, the, on that side. Left. Okay. Thanks to the coming of affordable home computers and video game systems, a participatory music culture emerged at the same time that was driven by an active and creative fan community. Practitioners in the so-called chip tune or chip music scene not just played the games, but also with them. By hacking commercial products such as games, home computers and consoles, and inventing their own program routines and software tools, they continuously pushed the boundaries of the material they found to create their own artifacts and performances. The resulting practice and culture of chip music, as well as chip music in games, of course, uh, has become the subject of interest in a distinct research area that we already heard a little about, which operates under the name ludomusicology. So in my talk today, I'd like to briefly introduce this emerging field in a first step, as I do not assume that everyone is familiar with what's currently going on in ludomusicology. In a second step, uh, I will give a short overview on how chip music and respective cultural phenomenon are discussed in this discourse by now. So it's a very ludomusicological view on this topic, so to speak. Uh, finally, then, I will present uh, this ongoing teaching experiment that is conducted by media archaeologist Stefan Hölkgen and myself at the Humboldt University Berlin during the semester, so it's still ongoing. Uh, in which we not only combine our very diverse perspectives on, the, uh, perspectives on the phenomenon of chip music, but also try out a quite hands-on approach by letting students actually reenact chip music. As ludomusicology and teaching in this field are still in their early days, the creation of syllabi and course plans, as well as the question of best practices in teaching, are the subject matter of an ongoing active exchange between ludomusicologists from all over the world. So, for example, when you look up the hashtag uh, ludomusicology on Twitter, the community is very active there, and there's a lot of uh, discussion currently ongoing as well. So, oh, how are you teaching this course? Okay, mm, I'm, I'm thinking about teaching something about, I don't know, the history of chip sounds in Japan. So, how, how can we do that? How can we approach that? But, um, first things first, what is ludomusicology? Ludomusicology is a sub-area of game studies, which is predominantly rooted in musicology. The field has started to pick up pace approximately 10 years ago, and is notably growing its body of publications since 2008. Additionally, organ organizational structures are starting to be established in the form of annual conferences and research groups under the roof of musicological societies. In 2016, some of these local groups, including my group, that's the Ludomusicology Research Group, um, founded the Society for the Study of Sound and Music in Games as a roof organization and established a subject-specific journal whose first issue is about to be published. It's the Journal of Sound and Music in Games. So what are we interested in? In a nutshell, ludomusicological research is interested in three basic subjects. Firstly, obviously, the study of music as a design element in games, and music games as a specific genre, investing, uh, in investigating uh, the theory, design strategies, or compos compositional practices, as well as developing subject-specific approaches and methodologies to study these subjects. Secondly, ludomusicology is interested in the study of cultural and fan-cultural practices that evolved around the games and their music, cultural interrelations with other media forms and musical genres, or best practices to use games in music educational contexts. And thirdly, ludomusicology is also interested in the ways in which games and music can both be studied as playful practices. As ludomusicologist Roger Mosley puts it, Bringing music and play into contact offers access to the undocumented means by which composers, designers, programmers, performers, players, and audiences interact with music, games, and one another. Ludomusicology recognizes that music and digital games are not merely to be read, seen, or heard, but played. So it's, um, 
it's kind of a, in a way it's kind of a no-brainer to say okay music is something that is played but how can we study that how can we discuss that how can we approach that and how can we find methodologies to investigate this in the frame of uh, of game playing so that's third area of course, uh, the study of soundship-based game music from the 1970s and 1980s has been the subject of interest in ludomusicological research since the very beginning. Pioneers in the field, such as Karen Collins and others, have written about the history of ship music in games and investigated the ways in which aesthetics and compositional approach, approaches have evolved. Documentaries such as Beep by Collins herself or Nick Dwyer's Digging in the Cards uh, that focuses very much on Japanese game music, offer an abundance of highly valuable material and first-hand insights from practitioners just, such as Junko Ozawa, Chris Hulsbeck, Rob Hubbard, and many others. Additionally, practitioners are regularly invited to share their knowledge at Ludomusicology conferences, so we have an annual, an annual conference series ongoing, both in the Ludomusicology uh, research group in Europe and the North American Conference of Video Game Music. They also have an annual meeting. Um, Ludomusicologist James Newman is working on establishing a game sound archive he founded in 2017 in collaboration with the British Library. So this is also an ongoing project and I wish he were here, he could tell you a lot about it. But um, that's not our topic today. Also the chip music scene has been of course investigated by Ludomusicologists, was the topic of documentaries such as Blip Festival, Reformat the Planet, and practitioners such as Johan Kotlinski, Anders Carlsen, Blake Troas, or Leonard J. Paul share their knowledge. So in short, um, ship music, both in the, fame of, uh, in, in, the, in the form of game music as well as in the form of a distinct musical genre, has already been a topic in Ludomusicological research from the very beginning. But as I have pointed out, um, most researchers engaged in the field have a background in musicology, or in my case, performance studies, and therefore, by now, mostly focus on the aesthetic level, questions of game design, nostalgia is a very huge topic, of course, the cultural impact, social culture, cultural aspects, or his, uh, writing historiographies. So in the core ludomusicological discourse, this has led to a tendency to ne neglect or at best treat technological and material aspects somewhat superficially. Subsequently, a certain narrative evolved that can be found in many, especially earlier publications. As my colleague Stefan Hölkgen describes it, most research into computer sound hardware favors historiographical re-narrations. The development of sound technology moves from the simple to the complex, from poor to better sound chips. Such evolution is often measured in terms of quantifiable attributes like year dates, sales figures, or technical elements such as bandwidth, numbers of different waveforms, sound channels, filters, etc. Sometimes this perspective leads to the marginalization of economically unsuccessful systems. So you oftentimes have like a history of commercial successes or successes of, of um, computer systems or console systems that are very widespread in a certain area. For example, uh, in, in North American and European ludomusicological writing, you find a tremendous amount of NES, Nintendo uh, research just because it was a predominant uh, system and a predominant um, present, let's say it, let's put it that way, a predominantly present company in, in these markets. It is only recently that ludomusicologists have started to further investigate these issues. All of them argue that especially for older systems, such as 1970s and 1980s card machines, home consoles, handhelds, or home computers, a close investigation both of the respective sound chips and their features, as well as version histories and the features of the entire systems these were built in, the context is mandatory. Looking at the technology, the instrument as such, so to speak, firstly reveals the respective material preconditions and secondly furthers a more in-depth understanding of compositional approaches and decisions both of contemporary game composers and chip music practitioners in the chip music scene. Subsequently, another discussion arouses more and more attention, the question of game and game sound preservation and accessibility. Because in order to conduct such investigations, the hardware, software, and the games must be available and functional. Emulations, recordings, or watching gameplay videos can help, of course, when focusing on the mere composition or describing how the music is played back during gameplay or 
reliving it a little yourself. So if you have played that game once, you can, ah, how was that in that scene? Okay, I'll look up a video and see how this works. But when it comes to understanding the original game feel, delivering the full original sonic experience, including unintended sounds or unintended hardware sounds used to create sounds and music, they fall short. As Hölkgen puts it, computers have never calculated in silence. Computer technology of the pre-electronic era emitted sound itself, because where there is friction, there will be sound. This did not even change when the calculating machines became inaudible. Their peripherals have always made sounds with their motors, tape and floppy drives, printers, scanners, rotors, fans, movable hats, hard disks and floppy drives, or relays, such as built-in cassette recorders and power supply choppers. These sounds were furthermore not just audible during gameplay, they were also used themselves to create sound and music, be it for games or in the form of these playful practices. They used to give a material basis to create music such as chip music, floppy music, circuit bending and the like. Um, I brought a little example here um, of the mute TRS-80 uh, with which you can actually create music using this uh, jukebox uh, basic <coughs> program. Um, well, you can read it up. Um, and uh, maybe some of you may also know the Flopotron, uh, where someone created a huge instrument uh, out of floppy drives and plays crazy music on that one. So uh, the use of hardware as sound producing, or well, even music producing um, resource. Subsequently, uh, Stefan Hölken suggests an alternative approach from the perspective of, quote, computer archaeology with its methods of measure measuring, demonstrating, and re-enacting technical processes. In other words, the scientific study of musical instruments and questions of historical performance practice needs to be introduced into ludomusicological discourse and teaching. And this is the very basic idea of our seminar that we tried out this semester. It was our goal to integrate all the above mentioned perspectives and offer students the opportunity to study chip music not only through reading texts and listening to works, but also via practical reenacting the practice they study and get a grasp, a very hands on grasp of uh, technical processes. As there is, of course, a necessity for some theoretical foundation, uh, we started out by offering to texts introducing our respective perspectives on the topic. <laughs> to ensure an open debate, of course, the lecturer whose text was discussed was absent. So um, they got uh, quite differing perspectives on the field from the very beginning. The following sessions were dedicated to expanding theoretical groundwork, both regarding basic te technological knowledge as well as ludomusicological theory. For the technological introduction, we were in the lucky position to embark in an in-house field trip, so to speak, <laughs> uh, visiting the Analog Studio, a collection of synthesizers created by a colleague from the Institute of Musicology around the corner, uh, who could give a practical demonstration of the basic technology and its practic practicalities. The next sessions then were dedicated to introducing ludomusicology uh, as such and ludomusicological uh, approaches, giving a general idea on current met methodologies and chip music. This introduction was again flanked by a second field trip, this time to the Computer Game Museum in Berlin, that sparked quite vivid debates on how to preserve and present chip music in a musical context. So we spent the entire session basically discussing, okay, does it make sense to have this sort of makeshift a card experience. Does it make sense to build uh, uh, the games, uh, the, uh, the console, to present the consoles in such made up, uh, yeah, how can we say, virtual environments? So for those of you who haven't been at the Computer Game Museum, uh, these are actual uh, photo photographies uh, of the Game Museum, and um, the consoles are situated in historical environments, so to speak. So you find a 70s, 80s, uh, Chilled, uh, kids room or living room in which the console is located so they try to give you the full on experience but of course um, these are not these are not uh, shielded in any way so you can hear the sounds from everywhere so you don't actually have um, this okay I'm sitting at home and I'm uh, playing my computer game and listen to the music because there's sound everywhere there are people going around and etc et so there, there was some debate coming up, how helpful this actually is for us then um, to study these sounds. 
or get a grasp of the, of the original experience. In addition, uh, the basic philosophy behind chip music as a playful and gaming assistant practice was offered as a theoretical approach. So we had to channel this a little then and uh, offer a distinct idea of um, how we are approaching chip music. This understanding builds on the concept of gaming literacy by Eric Zimmerman. He explicitly addresses the circumstance that play is far more than just play within a structure. Play can play with structures. Being literate in play means being playful, having a ludic attitude that sees the world's structures as opportunities for playful engagement. He emphasizes that he purposefully uses the term gaming and not game literacy. Because of the mischievous double meaning of gaming, which can signify exploiting or taking clever advantage of something. Gaming a system not means finding hidden shortcuts and cheats and bending and modifying the rules in order to move through a system more efficiently, perhaps to misbehave, but perhaps to change the system for the better. So the second part of the seminar that is currently still ongoing, as I said, is uh, dedicated to a respective experimental project. The students have split up into five groups, each of which are working on creating music with an old sound chip, namely uh, the sound interface device of the C64, uh, the Atari TIA, uh, the AY38912 of the Armstrad, uh, built in an Armstrad CPC, the Atari Pokey, and the, C, uh, the Z80 CPU of the Sinclair Spectrum. So quite widespread uh, sound chips at the time, at that time. The goal is a live chip music performance of, and that's a student's choice, Ravel's Bolero and New Order's Blue Monday. <laughs> As I said, uh, there, there, was a, there, there, there was a voting on that. <laughs> to create their parts, the students were introduced to the use of tracker programs by practitioners such as one-bit musician Utz, on the left side, um, and SIT specialist Malte Schulze, who happens to be a student assistant, which is very practical, at the institute, and could accompany the seminar with a tutorial during which he taught the necessary programming skills. Additionally, each remaining session is dedicated to one system, briefly discussing uh, its specificities and features before jumping back into the hands-on work. So the second, uh, the second part of the um, seminar is mostly hands-on practical work and then we also discuss a little the specific features and everything of these sound chips. The final performance will happen on February 12th as part of the Institute's research colloquium Medien die wir meinen. And in the last seminar session we will evaluate this experiment together with the students and collect their feedback. So to conclude, um, I would like to anticipate the evaluation a little by briefly highlighting the values, but also the problems such a teaching approach includes. Based on the feedback we've already received from students and dur uh, during the ongoing seminar, as well as my own observations. Let's start with the problems. Um, as you have seen, the seminar is very resource heavy both in terms of teaching staffs and guests being involved to cover the very wide theoretical ground, but also in terms, of course, of material needed. And here we are back at the, at the topic of this conference. So we need, uh, we need the hardware, we need, uh, we need access to this hardware that is still functional. Because without the available professionally preserved collection of the Signallabor in which the summer is, this seminar takes place, uh, and which is curated predominantly by initiative and private budget of Stefan Hölken, working with the original chips and systems would not be possible and make an actual reenactment impossible. So uh, these are just two photos of the, of the Signallabor. There's way more stuff uh, that we can play around which was with this very, which is very amazing and additionally they also have um, they also have um, uh, what's it called An, uh, they have another collection ah the media archaeological collection uh, where you can even like destroy old technology and break it open and reattach it and this, this is really for playing around with this stuff um, Additionally, the workload for students is also quite high, as the seminar involves reading all the texts, learning programming skills, meeting on their own time to work in the groups, and delivering a short seminar paper or programming routine. At the same time, it is interestingly precisely this very broad approach from opposed perspectives and mixing theory and practice, including getting insights from actual practitioners that has frequently been appreciated by the students. 
As most participants are BA students in fields such as musicology, cultural studies, art history, or media studies, most of them were quite comfortable uh, with the theoretical or musicological debates and discursive approach but quite unfamiliar with the technical and technological aspects of sound synthesizers uh, or old computer systems. Getting hands-on demonstrations by practitioners as well as a practical introduction into the basics of sound synthesis and programming helped them to engage with the technology and to get involved in the gaming system approach of the experimental performance, which is actually the core learning experience of the seminar. The active reenactment of chip music that involves lots of trial and error, there's a lot of swearing right now, <laughs> um, while working with original trackers, but this helps to deepen the understanding both of the material preconditions, but also this very philosophy of chip music as a playful and in many fold ways even radical gaming assistant practice. We will see during the next couple of weeks how the performance will come along, um, or if this part of the experiment will fail which again will be evaluated. Um, I brought a very short example of something that I recorded last week, um, what we already got out of the machines. We were very happy. Um, okay, I hope I could provide an idea of on our approach that combines the philosophy and practice of, practice of chip music in teaching and hope that we can offer a more comprehensive evaluation of this experiment in due time. For now, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'm looking forward to your input and questions.